My friends, it's just a matter of time before Avdivka falls into Russian hands. Check out what the Globe and Mail had to say. The assault on Avdivka is turning into one of the bloodiest battles of the Ukraine war. Meanwhile, journalists at the rear write, the forces of the Russian Federation are very far from the goal in Avdivka. All I'm saying. Oh, uh, here's the best one. There is no hint of encirclement of Ukrainian troops in Avdivka. Come on, don't bullshit me. If things are so good, why did the Ukrainian army withdraw its command post and all senior officers from Avdivka in the night of October 29th? It wasn't for some Halloween party. Honestly, let's just take a look at the map. Yo! The city is three quarters encircled. A very important factor of this battle will be the weather. The Russian army can easily house its troops and reserves in heated homes of the urban area of Donetsk. But Ukrainian soldiers won't have this luxury. As autumn sets in, with cold rain, the wind, the mud, the freezing nights, life in the trenches will become very difficult and morale might be impacted. And there are reports of entire Ukrainian platoons and companies that don't want to go on the offensive anymore. But everything is fine. Just like German newspaper Bild reported. Forgive my accent. Deutsche Panzer sollen Russen stoppen. German tanks to stop the Russians. It is believed that at the start of the Russian offensive, 15,000 Ukrainian troops were defending the sector of Avdivka. But the size of the grouping has now grown to 30,000 of which 8,000 are positioned in and around Avdivka, with the 110th separate mechanized brigade defending the city proper. All these troops are under extreme pressure, as all their fighting positions are constantly getting shelled. Officers from the 59th Brigade told Ukrainian newspaper Union that Ukraine could lose Avdivka due to the heavy fire pressure from the enemy. It's not an empty fear. In this article, Bloomberg wrote, North Korea sent 1 million rounds of artillery to Russia. Meanwhile, this Ukrainian soldier posted the following on Facebook. The situation is difficult. Avdivka is semi-encircled. And this ring may collide. He means that the northern and southern pincers could link up. He continues by saying, I think we will see under Avdivka what was observed under Bakhmut. Everyone knows that the battle of Avdivka is Bakhmut 2.0 with more Russian troops and no ammunition being held off. Here's what another Ukrainian soldier had to say. Avdivka is a matter of time. Many of my friends from there are already in hospitals. As more and more people in Ukraine's war cabinet are doubtful about Ukraine's capability to win the war, any major defeat could become disastrous. Once again, for more PR points, Zelensky refused to evacuate the troops from Avdivka and demanded that General Zaluzhny prepares the defense of the city. The Ukrainian armed forces are now transferring en masse all available reserves to this sector, like the 47th Mechanized Brigade with its Leopards and Bradleys, it's also very possible that the 2nd Battalion of the International Legion was also sent to the Avdivka meat grinder, just like the foreign fighters were sent into battle in Severodonetsk and Bakhmut. Their objective is to launch counterattacks on the Russian flanks in order to prevent the enemy from completing the encirclement of the Avdivka cauldron. Welcome to History Legends and here are the latest news of the Russia-Ukraine war. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. As you know, some of my videos have been targeted with limited or no ads. So make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal to keep the show running. Thank you to everyone that has already helped and welcome to the headquarters. To really understand what's going on, let's start with an overview of the battlefield. With all the strategic positions that have to be defended by Ukraine, obviously first we have the city of Avdivka proper. As you can see in this video, one neighborhood is made of dozens upon dozens of multi-story commie blocks. Just like we saw in Bakhmut, this sector is like a citadel and it's probably housing the bulk of Ukrainian reserves. Other than that, the rest of the city is composed of residential housing. For now, there's no general assault against the city proper and the Russians have resorted to softening Ukrainian positions with constant shelling. In this video, you can see the effect 
of the Russian artillery in a shattered residential sector of Avdivka. Storming the place will be difficult, because there are countless of defensive positions, tunnels and bunkers all around the city, which would have to be individually captured and secured before any push forward. The next obvious strategic position is the waste heap north of Avdivka. Here's a view from the Avdivka factory of this 200 meter high ground. As you can see, it completely overlooks the entire battlefield. The Russians secured this area on October 24th, and the Ukrainians wasted a bunch of drones in an attempt to destroy the Russian flags that were being raised. Of course, the control of this area opens a path for a direct assault of Russian forces on the coke plant, positioned right in front of the waste heap. Long story short, the chemical factory of Avdivka was built in 1963. It's your typical Soviet industrial area, just like in Mariupol and Bakhmut. At the moment, Russian recon units are continuously trying to get a foothold in the factory. However, for now, without much success. If the coke plant falls, the Russians could aim for a small and tighter encirclement and close the ring around Avdivka. Let's be honest, the coke plant is of strategic importance for Ukraine. It can easily sustain Russian artillery shelling and various airstrikes. And there are also so many firing positions. Remember what the Germans faced in the industrial area of Stalingrad. So I don't think the Russians will simply storm the area and launch a head-on assault. Unless they're ready to take massive casualties. In my opinion, the Russian army will try to bypass the industrial area. Perhaps they will attempt to secure this residential sector before making any move on the coke plant. Another possibility is bypassing it from the north. And this is where I have to mention the village of Ocheretine. Remember, I told you the Russians massively bombed its train station on day one of the offensive. As you can see on the map, the Ukrainians can use its railway station to quickly bring reinforcements to the zone of operations and disembark heavy equipment, which can then intervene all along the front. It's through Ocheretine that the 47th Mechanized Brigade was urgently transferred from the Robotine sector to Avdivka. We all remember this unit as being the flagship of this new Ukrainian army, as it was one of its best trained and best equipped formations. And the 47th will be used as a fire brigade, meaning they will go left and right to prevent any fires or enemy breakthroughs. Actually, it would be more accurate to say that the 47th Mechanized Brigade used to be an elite formation due to the heavy losses during the summer. The brigade was filled up with mobilized personnel. For sure, they went through some form of NATO training, but we all know what that's worth, right? It's also interesting to point out that, according to the few pictures that were publicly released, the men of the 47th traded their fancy M16s for Soviet-era AKs and RPKs. And regarding these new recruits, German media outlet Handelsblatt reported patriotisch aber unerfahren, patriotic but inexperienced. Honestly, this is what makes me so mad. Instead of taking the time to rebuild a strong Ukrainian army, all these mobilized troops are directly sent into another meat grinder where there will be casualties within a week. In the last few days, through intense fire support, the Russian 1436 Motor Rifle Regiment, mostly composed of mobilized personnel from Siberia, managed to cross over the train tracks and managed to push 1.5 kilometers towards Kalinovo. That's why in late October, the 47th Mechanized disembarked at Ocharetine, and then the brigade split up. One column went to Novobakhmutivka to reinforce the sector and for some reconnaissance in force, whereas the second column went to Berdichy to prevent Russian assault groups from capturing Stepove. Overall, the Ukrainian strategy seems to be the following. To launch serious counterattacks west of Krasnahorivka, in order to divert as many Russian troops away from the train tracks. That's because the Russian army concentrated a lot of troops in this sector, near the waste heap. Ukrainian troops on the ground complained of how the Russians were digging in and entrenching their newly captured positions east of the railway, which would make any Ukrainian counterattack very difficult. Blyad, not the shovels again, not the Bakhmut shovel, no! As you can see in this video on the 30th of October, Ukrainian artillery heavily bombarded Russian positions near the waste heap as they were trying to push towards the train tracks north of the coke plant. Also notice, the 
the devastating use of cluster munitions. By looking at a map, Russian infantrymen can really only push forward through these two tree lines. The first one is 800 meters long and the second one 1,500 meters. That's the only way for Russian infantrymen to safely leapfrog their way from one foxhole to another towards Ukraine positions in Stepove. Despite all the propaganda, we also have to mention the weak response of Russian counter-battery fire, which essentially allows Ukrainian artillery units to fire and quickly redeploy without being detected. A big firefight took place on October 31st, north of Avdivka, when armored elements of the 47th Mechanized Brigade were deployed along the train tracks to halt yet another Russian push towards Stepove, such as this Leopard 2A6 and these two M2A2 Bradleys. In this case, these American-made IFVs were not used for offensive operations, such as counterattacks, but simply to provide suppressive fire and to pin down enemy troops, which technically goes against their purpose, especially since these infantry fighting vehicles seem to be on their own without any riflemen in support. Anyway, this is where... Um, yeah, so the Ukrainians lost yet another German-made Leopard 2. In this case, a Leopard 2A6. As you can see on the map, it was geolocated right next to the train tracks between Stepove and the coke plant. According to early reports, it was a Russian T-72 that destroyed the Leopard. But according to Red Effect, it was rather the effect of an ATGM. This confirms the reports of advancing Russian infantry. Any concerns of the Ukrainian command I mentioned earlier. What's crazy is that this is the 7th Leopard 2 destroyed this week. Man, Oryx left the chat right when it got interesting. So we had this Leopard 2 and this one as well, which was soon followed by a lovely foursome in open air with three other armored vehicles that got the huge load and got destroyed right next to it. Number three is the Swedish modified Leopard 2A5 near Kupiansk. Number four was destroyed at night time while equipped with some mine troll. Two Leopard 2A4s were destroyed near Robotine as part of the 33rd Mechanized Brigade. One of them was hit at a distance and another was struck by two FPV drones. I should ask Red Effect, but overall the Russians claim that the Leopard 2s have suboptimal armor, insufficient maneuverability, and excessive dimensions. Personally, I think the main problem is that Ukraine doesn't have enough of those. If Ukraine expects to continue this war, they need some form of independence from the West and produce their own military equipment. And according to this Forbes article, as Ukraine loses more and more of its Leopard 2 tanks, it returns to the old T-72s. Anyway, a couple hours after the Leopard 2 was destroyed near the train tracks, the 47th Mechanized also lost an additional three M2 Bradleys right behind. And on November 2nd, another one was destroyed a further bit up the tracks. It's okay, finance bros. Nobody knows this. BAE stocks are doing great to the moon. Despite a lot of trouble, the Russian brute force tactics allowed them to steamroll through enemy lines and secure a crossing point over the railway line right in front of Stepove. Ukraine artillery crews are really the MVP of the battle. They made the Russian advance west of Krasnorivka extremely costly and painful. For example, on October 31st, this column tried to push across this open field in order to flank the village of Stepove. Might be a very sound maneuver on the map. But if we look at the footage, we see a group of three destroyed Russian vehicles from a previous attempt. Whereas there's an approaching column of four BTR-80s. Then the first and second vehicles get hit by mines. The third one stays put. And the fourth one that tries to escape gets hit with an artillery shell. Then the next day, on November 1st, in that same field, another column got hammered. In this one, we see seven destroyed vehicles from a previous attack all piled up. Now what's interesting is that the column is preceded by a mine rolling tank, followed by three to four BMPs. They seem to be roaming across the field. Once they're spotted by Ukrainian artillery, they quickly turn back. There are many of these sort of loops all across the terrain, all of which are paths that have been demined and that could theoretically be used for a future push. 
Oh, I almost forgot. A few days before, they tried as well. While there was some nice crispy snow. As you can see, the Russians rushed a column of roughly 15 vehicles forward. Once again, the path is opened by a mine rolling tank, plus another tank right behind, to provide suppressive fire. These two were followed by almost 12 to 13 BMP and BTRs. With 7 riflemen in each vehicle, that's a company of 91 men on the move. Regardless, Ukrainian howitzers hammered them with very precise artillery fire. And then we see all the Russian infantrymen just fleeing. At least they're running back across the path that was demined. The men are broken and flee the field of battle. Our walls crumble under the pounding of their weapons. For Russia, losing trained riflemen is much worse than losing a couple armored vehicles that can be retrieved and repaired anyway. From these latest attacks west of Krasnorivka, we can believe the Russians want to take control of this area in between both train tracks. As you know, the goal of maneuvering is to improve your current position with a better one, which would then open favorable options to you. From this triangle, Russian forces could flank Berdishi and Stepove, or support the right flank of the encirclement with an attack towards Novokarinove and Keramik. But they could even push to Bakhmutivka for a strike on Ocheretine. They could even combine some of these maneuvers for a simultaneous push against Ocheretine, for example. As you can see, the control of this small area opens many options to the Russians. An opposite would force the Ukrainians to spread out their forces even more to make sure to cover every one of these positions. Then we have the strategic position of Orlivka. The importance of this settlement is really straightforward. On this map, you can see all the supply roads linking the Avdivka garrison to its logistic bases at the rear. They all connect at Orlivka. So if the Russians capture this village, it's pretty much game over. The Russian army also claims to have fire control over all the roads that bring supplies and ammunition. I think English tourists have better fire accuracy when they're drunk in Spain and it's 4 a.m. As you can see at this point of the battle, the northern sector is by far the most important. But that doesn't mean that the events taking place on the southern part of the front have to be neglected. The southern flank of the Ukrainian grouping is protected by five positions. Svierne, the citadel, this military base near Spartak, the Tsar's Hunt restaurant, and the water filtration station. According to the latest map of Rybar, Russian assault squads have straightened the front line south of Svierne and are now only one kilometer away from the village. In this area, some Russian troops are now advancing towards enemy positions using tunnels, like this one, which is 160 meters long. Perhaps in a few days we could expect the Russians to reinforce this sector in order for a general assault on the settlement. And the Russians are also heavily bombarding this sector, which is defended by the Ukrainian 53rd Separate Mechanized Brigade. Interestingly, there seem to be relatively low Russian casualties in this sector as compared to in the north. For sure, there's some like in this video where we see a destroyed BMP near Vadiane and some regular drone dropping grenades. But I think the main difference is that on the southern part of the front, there are much less armored vehicles involved and it's much more in infantry battle. So let's say you won't have a spectacular Russian column getting destroyed with all its vehicles piled up. Now, if the village of Svierne falls, it's going to be problematic for the logistics of the Ukrainian army. The Russians could position some ATGMs with direct fire on any vehicle coming in and out of Avdivka. And of course, they would be one step closer to capturing Orlivka and closing up the encirclement. Meanwhile, it was reported that Russian assault units also managed a spectacular 2km push beyond the mine near Opitne, which in theory would now put them within striking distance of the citadel. Once again, this pushes the Russians into a favorable position as they occupy this triangle in between Svierne, the citadel, and the military base. That's all I have for you today. Let me know in the comment section what you thought of my analysis. If you're new to this channel, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you want to support my work, make sure to check out my Patreon or PayPal. The links are in the description below.